Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise be so. Amen. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his soul. Amen, amen. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, his mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise. Is holy God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the Holy One of Israel, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King of glory, the Lord of hosts, the one who has never lost a war, we bless your holy name. Thank you for defending us all these years long. Thank you that you were there protecting us while we were fast asleep. Because we never sleep, we never slumber. Thank you because but for you, there are many nights when the enemies didn't want us to wake up. But by your grace, we are still alive and well today. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God Almighty, as we gather together again to learn at your feet, please reach out to us. Amen. Let the heavens open Amen. and send help to us, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Well, let someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And please shake hands with two or three people and say, God, we fight for you today. And then we may please be seated. We are continuing our series on For Whom the Heavens Open. And we'll continue with our text, the same text, Joshua chapter 5, from verse 13 to 15. Joshua 5, 13 to 15. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Last Sunday we were looking at the categories of angels. 
we discuss angels that are called seraphims. We talked about angels that are called cherubims. Incidentally, just for you to understand how strong a cherub can be, the Bible tells us in Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 11, Second Samuel 22 verse 11, that when God wants to travel, I assume when he wants to travel, probably coming to the earth and is coming probably in the shape of a man. I don't fully understand that. He uses a cherub as a horse. He rides on the cherub. <laughs> uh, someone who is strong enough to carry the Almighty. That fellow must be pretty strong. <laughs> and like I've said before, if you ever see drawings showing angels as little babies with wings, just smile. Because what you are seeing are demons, not angels. By the grace of God, I have happened to see angels before. And I can tell you, an angel is big enough to carry a 747 plane in the palm of his hand. And a 747 plane will be just like a toy in the hand of an angel. The Bible teaches that the first thing an angel will tell you when you see him is fear not. Because there's no way you could see a real angel that you will not fear. And we talk about somebody huge. <laughs> you haven't seen hugeness until you have seen an angel. My prayer is that one of these days, God will show you an angel. And, uh, of course, you'll be frightened, but he will tell you, no, 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 don't, don't be afraid. I am here as your servant. And, we, and so we, we, we spoke about angels, about seraphims, about cherubims, about uh, some special angels, like uh, Gabriel, who who stand in the very presence of God, we gave a warning that you must handle children with care because their own angels have direct access to God. And we talked about the fact that angels excel in power, that an angel could kill 185,000 soldiers in one night. But we warned you that you are not to worship angels. That uh, if you know of organizations where they worship angels, um, maybe you will gently correct them. Because angels are your servants. Once you are born again, angels are your servants. And you don't want to worship your servants. So there might be a little bit of error if you hear some people saying they are worshipping angels. And you probably hear a lot of uh, people giving all manners of names to angels. I uh, will advise that you limit yourself to only those angels that were named by the Bible. The Bible mentioned Gabriel. He mentioned Michael. So when you begin to hear angel Raphael, angel whatever, whatever, um, 
don't be deceived. That's very important. Now, we said that when Joshua saw this angel, he asked him certain questions. Number one, who are you? Number two, why are you here? And the angel said, I am a captain, a commander in the army of the Lord. And I'm here to take over this fight from you. I am not here as an observer. And he said to Joshua, I'm about to take over, and so we need to settle one thing. First and foremost, we need to know who is in charge. Therefore, take off your shoes. This is very, very informative. You see, because when you study the scriptures very well, you will discover that servants do not wear shoes in those days. Only sons wear shoes. In the story of the prodigal son, when the prodigal son came back home, he said to his father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just take me as one of the servants. The father replied, I said, no, you are my son. You are lost, but now you are found. And to let you know that you are still my son, he said to the servants, give him shoes to wear. Not only give him clothes to wear, not only give him food to eat, give him shoes to wear. And so as true sons of God, you can go into the presence of God, your father, wearing shoes. That is very important. So you don't have to walk through the streets of Lagos or your whatever your city might be, barefooted. It's not a sign of respect to God. If you are a son, you are a son and you can wear shoes. That's quite an interesting information that I just feel you should know. And then, the second answer, I mean the, the second question is, are you for us or are you against us? And I said, that question is opening our eyes to certain informations. Some of them we probably have learned before, but there are some of us who are new and might not know that there are four ways God could respond to you when you are fighting a battle. The first way is that God could be against you. If God is fighting against you, you are going to lose. There's no way God can fight against you and you will win. Exodus chapter 14 from verse 21 to 25. Exodus 14, 21 to 25. The children of Israel were by the Red Sea. The army of Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his army were pursuing them. God gave instruction to his servant, raise your hand against the sea. God, he, he did. The sea opened. The children of Israel went into the middle of the sea on dry ground. 
And Pharaoh and his army follow them into the middle of the sea. That should tell you something is missing here. Because if, if you are Pharaoh and you suddenly see the sea opening to the people you are pursuing, you should have enough sense to say, I think I better leave these people alone. But the English have a proverb. They say, whomsoever the gods want to destroy, they first of all make them mad. If you are pursuing someone, and the fellow has run to take hold of the Lord of hosts, Leave that fellow alone. Because to keep pursuing that fellow can only mean destruction to you. Because when the army of Pharaoh got into the middle of the sea, suddenly God began to walk on their chariots so that the chariot can no longer run the way they should run. It was only at that stage that they realized. And they said, Hey, let's run back, because it is certain God is fighting against us. But by then it was too late, because the sea came together again, and they were all drowned. When God is against someone, that fellow will lose. And how do I know if God is against me? First Peter chapter 5 from verse 5 to 6. First Peter 5 from verse 5 to 6 tells us that God resists the proud. When Pride begins to take over your life. You are putting yourself into a situation where God will be against you. When you begin to attribute to yourself the glory that should be given to God, when you begin to think that your success is as a result of your ability, ah, when you begin to boast, don't you know who I am? You are asking for divine resistance. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, Daniel 4, verse 37, Nebuchadnezzar, who was once boasting that there was no king like him, after God dealt with him, he opened his mouth and said, Whoever exhausts himself before this God is able to abase. God can knock the fellow down. In Luke chapter 18 verse 14, Luke 18 verse 14, it is written, Whoever exhausts himself shall be abased. It is the one who humble himself that shall be exalted. Learn this lesson and become humble. Because if you ever start to believe that there's no one like you, you are the best, you can do this, you can do that, the Almighty God might want to teach you a lesson. And that lesson might not be pleasant. Somebody said, then maybe I should pray that God will humble me. That's a dangerous prayer. He expects you to do it yourself. Because when he decided to humble some people in the Old Testament, the Bible says, he got them walking around in circles for 40 years to humble them. You don't want to go around in circles for 40 years before you learn humility. 
The Bible says you can do it yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of God. Without him, you can do nothing. The word of God says clearly, 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 9, 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 9, by strength shall no man prevail. Humble yourself and begin it right now. And it will amaze you how the tide in your battle will turn. Number two, God could be neutral. He can just be watching you, not fighting against you, but he will just be a spectator. Like some of you who want him to be, let him sit down in his heaven, minding his own business, and leave me alone on earth, and let me mind my own business. But if God remains neutral, you will lose. My father used to tell me that when a lion wakes up in the morning, he prays. His prayer is, God, show me the animal I will eat today and leave the two of us alone. Don't help me, don't help the animal. Why? The lion knows if God does not help the animal, the animal is as good as dead. If the devil ever prays, thank God I I believe he won't pray. The prayer he will probably pray will be, God, show me that Christian that I will destroy today and leave the two of us alone. Remember the Bible calls calls him someone who walks about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. I pray that God will not leave you alone. Because if he leaves you alone... The enemy will finish the rest. You don't believe me? Ask Samson. In Judges chapter 16 from verse 18 to 21. Judges 16, 18 to 21. All that God did was leave Samson alone. He woke up from his sleep. Samson, Samson, the enemy is here. He said, oh, no problem. I will go forth as ever before. And the Bible says he didn't know God has departed. God wasn't fighting against Samson. He just left him alone. Because his cup was full. If you keep on sinning, and you seem to be getting away with it, it might be that God has left you alone. If God leaves you alone, the enemy will finish the rest. There's something very instructive. In Exodus chapter 17, from verse 5 to 13, Exodus 17, from verse 5 to 13, the Amalekites came to attack the children of Israel while they were on their way to the promised land. Moses went to the top of the hill. He took Aaron and Hall with him. And he told Joshua, please lead the little army we have against this enemy. As long as Moses' hands were raised, Joshua was winning. Whenever the hands of Moses came down, the battle turned. Joshua was winning downhill because Moses was contacting God uphill. If you lose contact with God, the battle will turn against you. 
Many of us might not know the reason why during our conventions, you don't normally see me during the day, somebody had to be on the hilltop, raising up his hand to the Almighty God and saying, Lord, help us. You can have millions of people gather together in a place with hundreds of thousands of them being children in an open place. Open, porous. And the meeting advertised. So the enemies know you are gathering. The enemies know the time. There has to be a force beyond human ability keeping the enemy at bay. We need to understand these simple principles. That's why we need to appreciate our leaders a little more. When you are in your various uh, parishes and things are happening, congratulations. But there's someone somewhere praying. You don't want God to leave you alone. You don't want him to be neutral. Then number three, what happens when God is with you? Ah, then you will win. You will fight. No doubt about that, but he's fighting with you now. And so, victory is certain. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 34 to 51, 1 Samuel 17, from verse 34 to 51, when David was about to face Goliath, and there was nobody ready to face him, and he went to King Saul and said, Ah, ah, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. I've killed a lion before. I've killed a bear before. But it's not me that killed them. The God that was with me, that was fighting with me, then he see on my side, he will take care of this Goliath also. Remember what King Saul said. Go, and the Lord be with you. You know the end of the story. If God is fighting with you, you will win. Without any doubt. Victory is sure if God is fighting with you. Because he will supply you with strength. Isaiah chapter 40 from verse 28 to 31. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Tells us that there is a God who is never tired. No matter how strong you are as a young man, you will get tired. But there's someone who's always giving strength to the weak. His name is the Almighty God. You're connected to him. He said, no matter how fast you run, you won't get tired. It doesn't matter how long you walk, you won't get weary. He said, you can even fly with wings like an eagle. So occasionally when you see a man of God who seems to be tireless, how does he do it? Today is here, tomorrow is that way. How oh, it is because there is someone he's connected to. Connect to that person. And you will be renewing your strength from day to day. But we are running out of time. And there is still this important point. What if God is fighting for you? Ah. <laughs> then you win even without fighting. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. Romans 8 31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Who is that enemy? Who will want to fight you if he sees the one behind you as the consuming fire? Even a mad dog will recognize fire. 
Uh, in Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 7, Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 7, the Bible may declare that when you have surrendered completely to God, then the enemies that come against you will be smitten before your face. He didn't say you will do the smiting. The enemies will be smitten before your face. God will deal with the enemies. He said when they come one way, they will flee seven ways. Which is one of the major reasons why those of you who are not yet on the side of the Lord should do so urgently. Urgently. So that you will begin to live the rest of your life as even as if there are no enemies. Because if they like, let them gang up against you. The Lord will smite them. They will come against you one way and flee seven ways. Surrender your life to Jesus. You gain a lot by doing so. Because he will now begin to fight your battles for you. And your victory will be certain. So if you want to give your life to Jesus, this is an opportunity again to do so. It's either you go before the altar, if there's an altar where you are, or you are in your living room, maybe you just stand up to let him know you want to surrender your life to him. Or maybe you just raise your hand to show him that you are surrendering. And then you pray a prayer and say, Lord, I'm surrendering to you. I want to be on your side. Please save my soul. Let your blood wash away my sins. And I will serve you for the rest of my life. And I will pray with you now. And God will save your soul. My Father, my God, I want to thank you once again for your word. Ah, and I want to thank you for all those who have decided right now to surrender their lives to you. Father, please receive them. Have mercy on them. Let your blood wash away their sins. Save their souls. Receive them into the family of God. And from now on, fight their battles for them. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Well, I want to thank God for those of you who have given your life to Jesus. And I want to assure you from now on, by the grace of God, I will be praying for you. So please contact me very quickly. I would love to know your names, your address, and your prayer request. And then locate a redeemed Christian Church of God near you. They are all, they are all very near you. Within five minutes, I'm sure you will find one. And tell the pastor there, that I sent you and it will tell you what to do next. God bless you. How oh, let someone shout another hallelujah. <laughs>